uh, my pleasure this evening to introduce Matthew Brinkle, who is the curator at the USS Constitution Museum. And Matthew is, has been there for seven years and has been involved in a research project that is very interesting um, uh, about all the sailors that were on board Constitution during the War of 1812. He has um, fortuitously a, a new book that's just come out. We have it for sale downstairs. It's a very nice price of ten dollars. Um, the ones that we have downstairs are all signed by Matthew and the other two um, authors, uh, Lauren McCormick and Sarah Watkins. And um, so, and this is, uh, I think, uh, as I say, a very great deal of uh, research went into this, and it's, it's fascinating. Wonderful images and a very nice, nice uh, publication. As I say, it's, it's a great pleasure to have Matthew here this evening. He's been here before um, speaking in, about his other uh, interests. He and his wife, um, um, Victoria, who is also here, um, spoke about their um, interest in, um, at the time that they spoke here, about uh, 18th century uh, colonial co costuming. Um, but Matthew is also interest in, interested in early costuming in general, and I think may have something to say about sailors' um, uh, clothing as well. So it's my pleasure to introduce him, and um, thank you very much for being with us. Thank, uh, thanks, Pam, and thanks to everyone here for coming tonight. Um, it's wonderful to see this many people enthusiastic about Constitution. Um, I sort of am involved with the ship every day, and uh, you know sometimes you start to see the eyes glaze over uh, when you talk to people about it. Um, so it's wonderful that uh, so many people are here tonight. Um, tonight I'd like to talk to you about some of the common sailors who served on Constitution during the War of 1812. Now, when we talk about naval history, we often think of Alfred Thayer Mahan and Teddy Roosevelt and Samuel Elliott Morrison, uh, those great canonical names. Um, you know, it was traditionally all about technology and tactics and the strategies of uh, admirals and politicians. And of course these are important topics to understand, but for me, and I think for a lot of people out there, uh, this, these things put history at an arm's length. Uh, at the Constitution Museum, we want to make the history of the early Navy, and by extension uh, the history of uh, the nation itself, the early nation, um, more accessible, and we think the best way to do that is to make it more personal. So about 10 years ago, the museum decided to focus research uh, on the lives of the common sailors who crewed the ship in the early 19th century. Now, I've personally been working on this project for more than six years, actually almost seven years now, um, and I can tell you it's been quite an eye-opening experience, um, but also a lot of work. How many of you have done genealogy on your own families? Yeah, a fair number of you. So you know it can be uh, a complicated search, full of uh, dead ends and, and confusion, especially when you have five people with the same name. Um, now, of course, we encountered the same problems with our research, but the biggest obstacle was the sheer size of the group we were looking for. Uh, there were 1,171 individuals who served on the ship during the war. Um, but that search hasn't been fruitless. Uh, we now have good information on about 500 of them, which I have to say, when I started this, uh, I never dreamed that we'd find that much information on these people. works. Um, now, our research has revealed one essential truth, and that is that there's never been a set of men more misunderstood. Uh, they were misunderstood in their own time, and they're certainly misunderstood today. For us, they're either hardy tars uh, floating somewhere between myth and legend, um, or the worst set of mortals ever to live, addicted to strong drink and fast women. <laughs> now, the problem is, uh, even many of their contemporaries were unsure of what to think about them. Uh, writers spilled a lot of ink during the Napoleonic Wars talking about sailors and noting their faults. Even those who had actually sailed on ships and regularly associated with them often found them less than charming. Consider Herman Melville's description of the frigate United States, or the Never Sink as he called it, uh, the crew on board in the 1840s. And he said, from a frigate's crew might be called out men of all callings and vocations, from a backslidden parson to a broken down comedian. The Navy is the asylum for the perverse, the home of the unfortunate. Here the sons of adversity meet the children of calamity, 
And here the children of calamity meet the offspring of sin. Bankrupt brokers, boot blacks, black legs, and blacksmiths here assemble together and cast away tinkers, watchmakers, quill drivers, cobblers, doctors, farmers, and lawyers, compare past experiences, and talk of old times. Wrecked on a desert shore, a man of war's crew could quickly found an Alexandria by themselves and fill it with all the things which go to make up a capital. So <laughs> the sons of adversity, calamity, and sin. Uh, that's not very flattering. Um, but that pretty much sums up genteel society's opinion of naval seamen. Obviously, Melville is using hyperbole and uh, he's trying to make a point and he has a very special agenda he's trying to forward in his book. Um, but there must have been some truth to what he said, right? So let's compare that description to the description of Marine Pfeiffer Thomas Byron, who served on Constitution throughout the War of 1812. He said, Old Ironside's crew, quote, was the smartest and her men the most capable ever known in the annals of history. So we'll take that for what it's worth. Um, but then he said, many of her men had been brought up on the sea. Some had been masters of vessels and they were as united as brothers. And to me that last bit rings true. And as we'll see tonight, um, a lot of this was, was quite true uh, when it came to marble headers in the crew. So how do we reconcile these two views of American sailors? I think the first thing we have to do is look at the chronology of the period. The maritime industry changed considerably between the 1810s and the 1840s. Fewer and fewer native-born Americans with any sort of ambition chose to go to sea by the time uh, Melville was writing. It was always a rough life, and if one could make good wages uh, working in a shore-based industry or heading west, then so much the better. This wasn't really the case in 1812. Western expansion and large-scale industrialization was still a generation away. The United States population was mostly <coughs> confined to the eastern seaboard, and for people who grew up in the growing seaports, the sea was the frontier. Why scratch in the rocky soil uh, if you could sail to Liverpool or Leghorn or Sumatra or Canton? International trade was where the wealth was concentrated, and making a few good voyages could set a man up in the world. Now, the ships sailing out of Boston or Salem or Marblehead, uh, they weren't crewed by a bunch of lousy packet rats or, or malcontents, uh, but by the sons of local families. Uh, the, and the more we learn about these men, uh, the more we see them as the sober, hardworking, middle-class people that they were. And I think for the most part, the same was true of the sailors who joined the Navy during this earlier period. Um, I don't want to overstate that too much. Uh, we know there were troublemakers in the crew, some really mean, impoverished men. Um, in, in fact, we know of a couple of uh, murderers and a man who beat his <coughs> wife. But uh, on average, um, these guys really were average. Now, trying to unearth these men can be a challenge. In many ways, the Navy kept pretty awful records. Uh, the ship's muster rolls recorded a sailor's name, his rank, his date of entry, and his discharge. And that was about it. There's no age, no place of origin, no physical description, nothing that would help us identify this person uh, in other records. And then add to this fact that some of them, especially those born in Great Britain, and there were many of them, uh, might have been serving under false names, and you can understand why there could be trouble fleshing out their lives. Now luckily there are other ways of tracking them down. Um, it might seem like a paradox, but the worse a sailor's life, the more we know about him. Um, and it's one of those unfortunate ironies of history that those people whose stories have happy endings are doomed to remain obscure. Uh, men who served the Navy faithfully for two years uh, and then faded from the record, uh, we just can't find them. But a uh, long and detailed paper trail follows those who suffered some sort of life-altering wound or accident. The most illuminating source has been the Navy pension applications at the National Archives in Washington. Uh, if a sailor received a wound or was otherwise disabled in the line of duty, he was eligible for a monthly stipend from the government, which was usually equal to half his pay. Sometimes men were so badly wounded that they were eligible for uh, a full stipend of or their, their full pay. Um, but mostly it was just half pay. Uh, so to receive this payment, they had to prove that they had, in fact, been in the service and that they had been disabled. So that means that all these files contain 
uh, affidavits and declarations uh, by all sorts of people, <laughs> including the applicant sailor himself in many cases. Nearly 150 of Constitution's seamen and officers applied for pensions. And also widows and orphan children, um, minor children, uh, were eligible for government assistance. And these applied for relief too. So in the end, we have this great body of information to work with. Uh, when we combine these records uh, with the usual birth, marriage, and death records, uh, court transcripts, and all those sorts of things, uh, we can really begin to recreate what their lives were like. Now, since we're in Marblehead here tonight, uh, I want to focus on a few of these men who had a connection to the town. Um, <clears throat> at this point, we know for certain that about 100 of the enlisted men came from Massachusetts. Um, of those, uh, 49 hailed from Marblehead. And this is the list of the names that we've come up with. Um, the ones with the question mark beside them, we're still a little uncertain. We're not sure uh, if, if the man either lived in Marblehead or, or was born in Marblehead. Um, I'm sure you'll recognize a lot of these names. Uh, we were just walking around the streets here um, before the lecture, and I saw a good number of these names on the street signs around here. So uh, not, not a surprise. Um, now, the number may actually be higher. Uh, the ship sailed from Boston for most of the war. Didn't start the war in Boston, but, but sailed for the, most of the remainder of the war out of Boston. Uh, and there were recruiters working the North Shore quite heavily. Um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if the number was actually higher than this. Um, as expected, the seaports contributed more men than any place else. Salem, Marblehead, and Beverly um, made up over 50%, well over 50% of the Massachusetts born crew members. Uh, but there were also men from places like Chelsea, Lynn, Danvers, Ipswich, Newburyport, and Gloucester. Now our, sto our starting point for this list is a document here in the Historical Society's collections. Uh, in 1814, master's mate John Adams drew up a quarter bill showing the battle stations of every man on the ship. Now, either Adams or uh, somebody else at a later date helpfully put a little check in pencil beside the names of all the men from Marblehead. So um, that, was, that was a good starting point. And the rest of them we've filled in from other sources like those pension records uh, and clues in the usual genealogical records. Now, besides geographic origins, most of these people had something else in common. Nearly all had been at sea for many years. Some served in naval vessels before joining Constitution but most had sailed in merchant vessels or in the fishing fleet. Uh, having said that, of course, the important question is why would these skilled men, and sailors were considered highly skilled labor, uh, why would they choose to join the Navy over the merchant fleet or even over a privateer uh, that offered a shorter cruise and the possibility of a great amount of prize money? Well, certainly patriotism, um, or more properly nationalism, uh, motivated these men to enlist in what they would have called public vessels, uh, but the biggest motivator, I think, was economic. They had to make a living and feed their families. Now, for this to make sense, we need some background. France and Britain had been locked in conflict off and on since 1793, and America, because of its large and, and growing merchant fleet, quickly became embroiled in the fight between the world's superpowers. Both the British and the French had made it a uh, habit of confiscating American ships and cargoes, in direct violation of America's neutrality and sovereignty. The US could hardly hope to fight back militarily, but it was thought that economic warfare might prove effective. Um, in case you don't know, that's George III up there and his opponent, Napoleon, staring across a period cartoon uh, showing some of the, the dangers of the period. Um, in 1807, Congress, at the assistance of the, the Jefferson administration, passed the Embargo Act that uh, banned trade between the U.S. and foreign ports. This was replaced by the Non-Intercourse Act in March 1809, uh, which lifted the other, all the other embargoes except for those on Britain and France. In May 1810, this was superseded by the so-called Macon's Bill No. 2 uh, that lifted all the remaining embargoes. But the law also stipulated that if either Britain or France recognized the U.S. as a neutral and stopped harassing American ships altogether, then the U.S. would immediately cease trade with the other one. Uh, so, of course, Napoleon realized this and, and jumped at the chance to further his aims uh, and declared that henceforth France would allow American ships to trade freely with French ports. 
Um, this, of course, provoked the British and uh, pushed the two nations, the, the US and Great Britain, closer to war. Now, all this political maneuvering had a direct impact on New England seafaring communities. Even once the strict embargoes were lifted, merchants and their employers took a beating. Both the British and French were stopping, harassing, and impounding American ships and cargoes. Uh, the British were notorious for impressing American seamen into the Royal Navy. Uh, we've all heard of the, the impressment problem. Um, but as a result of this, insurance rates soared and fewer and fewer ships put to sea. Sailors were out of work and all the men and women who worked in the allied trades, things like boat building and sail making and coopering, uh, all of these people started to lose work as well. So when the U.S. declared war in June 1812, there was both a great deal of resentment built up in the maritime communities, but also a real need for wages. And this resulted in a huge surge in recruiting. In fact, Constitution sailed for most of the war with far more men than she was supposed to carry. Uh, she was officially authorized to have a crew of 420 men. She actually had 485 for most of the war. So what about the individuals caught up in all of this? I'd like to start with the story of one sailor whose life represents uh, I think all the tensions and dangers in the early 19th century Atlantic world. His name was uh, Philip Brimblecombe. He was born here in Marblehead in 1786 and he launched his career like so many other young men in town by going to sea in search of cod. Uh, in 1809 he gave up the, the hook in the line and he shipped on board his uncle's schooner called the Springbird for a voyage to Spain. Turns out this was a bad decision. Uh, taken by a French privateer just off the coast of Spain, the French government impounded Brimblecombe's ship because it sailed in violation of Napoleon's Milan Decree of 1807, uh, which said that any ship that had submitted to search by the British or had traded with Britain or its colonies or paid any sort of tax to the British government was considered equal to British property and was therefore liable to capture by French ships. So really there was no way around this. Um, the decree also imposed a paper blockade of all British territory, meaning um, the rest of the world basically was not supposed to trade with, with Britain, according to Napoleon. So unemployed, nowhere to go, he signed, Brimblecombe signed on board a French merchant ship bound for the Indian Ocean. Four days out, a British cruiser took the ship and Brimblecombe found himself a prisoner of the Royal Navy and they promptly sent him to a prison ship in England. Now in October 1810, he managed to send a letter describing his ordeal to his mother, Hannah, back here in Marblehead. And the gist of it was, well, America's not at war with Great Britain. Americans shouldn't be held as prisoners of war in England. Uh, so Hannah sent Philip's protection certificate, which was a sort of uh, passport uh, and birth certificate rolled into one, and also his baptismal record, uh, to the American consul in London to prove that her son was an American citizen. The consul responded that the English considered Brimblecombe a prisoner of war because he had been captured while serving on a French privateer. So not liking this response, Mrs. Brimblecombe had a friend write to Secretary of State James Monroe requesting his help. Meanwhile, back in England, uh, the British took Brim Brimblecombe from prison and forced him to serve on board HMS Marlin or Merlin. No one was quite sure of the name of the ship. There's the Merlin up there. Um, not willing to wait for a diplomatic resolution to this ordeal, though, uh, he made his escape by deserting in the spring of 1812 and entered on board a ship bound for Newburyport. Now, some people are just pla plagued with, with bad luck. Uh, the ship wrecked on the Orkney Islands, and Brimblecombe and his shipmates traveled from those islands back to mainland Scotland, where he shipped on board an American brig. Um, unfortunately, by this point, America had declared war on Britain, and during the voyage across the Atlantic, um, off of uh, George's Bank, the ship was captured and was taken into Newfoundland as a prisoner. Uh, but luckily, he was exchanged uh, in September of 1812, so he didn't spend too much more time in a, in a British prison. So here at the age of 26, uh, Brimblecombe had experienced enough misfortune to last most men several lifetimes. His next step made sense for someone who must have just seethed with desire for, for revenge. Uh, on September 25th, 1812, he enlisted as an able seaman on board the frigate Constitution. 
The ship had just returned from uh, a victorious encounter with HMS Guerriere off the coast of Nova Scotia, and her new captain, William Bainbridge, had no trouble recruiting men to serve on the lucky vessel. Unfortunately, the, uh, the ship's luck didn't rub off on Brimblecombe. Uh, as Constitution sailed south during October and November, the sailors frequently exercised at the great guns, uh, learning, their, uh, learning to perform their duties with speed and accuracy. And according to the ship's quarter bill, which you can see there, uh, Brimblecombe served as the first loader to gun number one on the gun deck. And he did his duty there on December 29th, 1812, when Constitution encountered HMS Java off the Brazil coast. Uh, it was a dangerous posi position, and this was a hard-fought battle. To load the cannon and ram home the powder, uh, the ball and the wad behind it, the loader thrust his arm partly out the open gun port. And in the midst of, midst of the action, as he bent to load the gun, a British cannonball shattered his arm below the elbow. And uh, Surgeon Amos Evans amputated the limb, which was completely mangled. Uh, and although the stump healed quickly, uh, the young sailor remained in constant pain. With only one arm, Brimblecombe couldn't work as a seaman, the only work he'd ever known. Twice he wrote to the Navy seeking employment and for an increase in his $6 per month pension, uh, which he and his mother, his widowed mother, uh, relied on. And he complained, a quote, some of the rest that was wounded with me has had an addition to their pension money. And you can see, here's his discharge and pension signed by William Bainbridge, uh, and then the, the jacket to his, his pension application. Uh, Brimblecombe finally got a job at the Charlestown Navy Yard in 1816 and at the Portsmouth Navy Yard the following year. By 1820, he was, quote, unable to do anything for a living, and since he had no friends on earth, he asked the government to take his request into consideration and look after a poor, distressed, crippled sailor who for 22 long months has never seen a well day. Unfortunately, we haven't been able to find any response to this. Um, Philip uh, Brimblecombe died of a fever at Marblehead uh, on February 1st, 1824, at the age of 37. So I don't want you going away thinking, oh, these people had terrible lives. Um, as I said before, it just so happens that we know the most about those who, who suffered misfortune. So I think our next sailor uh, had a pretty good life. Uh, Ezekiel Darling was born in Duxbury in 1789. His parents, David and Elizabeth Appleton Darling, were both from Marblehead, and it seems they returned here when Ezekiel was still a child. When he was 11 years old, he enlisted on board Constitution as a boy. Now, he was a, a boy by age, but also by rank. This was equivalent to the, the far more descriptive term of landsman uh, rating in, in the Royal Navy, someone with little or no experience on board ship. And he served at the very tail end of the Quasi War with France, uh, and then he came home to Massachusetts, but he didn't stay here for very long. Um, in 1803, he enlisted again, this time to fight the Barbary pirates in North Africa. And uh, this is what Constitution looked like during that tour. He was uh, transferred to the schooner uh, Scourge at Sicily just before Commodore Edward Preble's big attack on Tripoli in August of 1804. Now, what he did for the next seven years is a little bit of a mystery. Uh, it's likely he re-enlisted in the Navy, uh, perhaps with an occasional voyage on a merchant vessel. We know that he was in Boston in June 1812, and he married a man, a uh, man, no, married a woman uh, named Maria Vento. Um, and by October 1812, he had enlisted on board Constitution yet again. But this time, Captain William Bainbridge appointed him gunner. Now, this was no common seaman's position. Uh, the gunner was in charge of all the great guns, the iron cannons that lined the ship's side, as well as the small arms and all the associated tools. Most important of all, he was in charge of the gunpowder, which on a wooden ship uh, is a dangerous, substance, a dangerous substance anywhere, but especially on a, on a ship made of wood and filled with paint and tar and, and that sort of thing. Um, so great attention was paid to properly securing the magazine. The captain kept the keys and only the gunner was allowed to open that space. This is uh, an 1816 plan of Constitution's Orlop deck that shows the magazine where he worked uh, on December 29th, 1812, during the battle with HMS Java, filling cartridges and handing them out to make sure the guns didn't run out of powder. 
He'd have been working pretty quickly, I think, because the ship fired away about 2,500 pounds of gunpowder during the battle. And uh, even though he was sitting on top of many tons of explosives, he survived the battle unscathed. Uh, his station was well below the waterline and, and out of reach uh, for, of enemy shot. Now, strangely enough, Darling's position was never made official by a warrant from the Navy Department. He doesn't appear on any of the officers' lists, and he never seems to have served as a gunner on any other ship. We know he left Constitution sometime after February 1813. He probably returned to Marblehead. Um, he might even have gone out in a privateer. After the war, he was, quote, engaged in commerce. Um, he may have sailed in command of some successful merchant voyages because he was often addressed as Captain Darling in later years. Now, in the mid-1820s, uh, he had his portrait painted. And uh, this hangs across the street now, the Lee Mansion. Um, and to me, this is a picture of a man who is moving up in the world. In 1825, he became a trustee of the Methodist Religious Society of Marblehead. And as his prominence in the local community grew, um, in 1834, he was elected to the Massachusetts House of Representatives from Marblehead. And after leaving office, he became the keeper of the newly erected Marblehead Lighthouse, a post he held for 25 years. And uh, he, he made $400 a year as a <laughs> lighthouse keeper, which, you know, not a bad wage, but not a great one either. Uh, in 1843, a federal lighthouse inspector praised Darling, saying, quote, perfect order, cleanliness, and apparent comfort reigned throughout the whole establishment, much to the credit of the keeper. The job wasn't without its risks, however. Uh, in the same year, Darling won a gold medal from the Massachusetts Humane Society for helping to rescue the crew and passengers of the brig John Hancock uh, when it went ashore on Tinker's Island. By 1860, he was said to be uh, blind from the glare of the lamps. I, I'm not sure how that could happen, but I guess he was up there a lot, staring at those, those lamps. Um, in that year, <clears throat> he resigned his post to Miss Jane C. Martin, who was one of the first, if not the first, uh, woman lighthouse keeper in the country. Now, Darling uh, died on March 28, 1865, of old age, as it says in the death record. Uh, he was 76 years old. In his will, he bequeathed all his goods, chattels, and effects of every description to his dear beloved wife, Maria. And then he writes this little aside at the bottom. He says, if you have any property to leave, I would have you leave it to those that stands by you and treats you the best. Which is a lovely little sentiment. <laughs> um, so our, our next sailor uh, had an equally eventful life. Uh, David Quill was born in Marblehead on June 24, 1787. He was the youngest son of Robert and Elizabeth Brimblecombe Quill. Um, again, we haven't been hugely successful in discovering much about the early lives or careers of any of these men, but for Quill at least, we know uh, he served as a mariner before the war. He applied for a Seaman's Protection Certificate, that, that sort of passport I was talking about earlier, uh, in 1803 uh, when he was 16. And, um, he, he evidently had become highly trained in his profession because when he enlisted in the Navy and joined Constitution's crew in August 1813, Captain Charles Stewart rated him quartermaster. Now, this was a position held by the most experienced seamen uh, in the ship. Quartermasters worked under the direction of the sailing master and their duties included supervising the men coiling the anchor uh, cable as it came on board, stowing provisions and ballast in the hold, and keeping an eye on the men at the wheel. But during Tricky maneuvers are in battle, the quartermasters themselves manned the helm. Uh, now Quill, along with three other quartermasters, uh, were, uh, was doing his duty at the helm during the ship's battle with HMS Cyan and HMS Levant on February 20th, 1815. Uh, casualties on Constitution were light, but at some point during the action, a British shot struck Constitution's rail and sent a splinter of oak sailing across the deck and it struck Quill in the left elbow, uh, leaving the limb partially disabled. He never regained full use of his arm. Now, when the ship returned home, Quill received his discharge and went home to Marblehead. Uh, he worked as best he could for the next six years, and in April 1821, he was able to secure a partial pension for his injury. This is a very bad copy of that pension uh, application, but um, 
And he was only getting $5 a month. He'd been making uh, between $18 and $20 while in service, but the, the government thought $5 would get him through. Uh, in 1817, he married Sally Homan, uh, but she died in 1829. And this was the same year that Quill sat for portraitist William Bartol, uh, again, right across the street here. Um, and <laughs> his, re his grief, uh, his recent grief, may explain the, the sort of sour look on his face. But uh, all in all, this is the image of a man who's doing pretty well for himself. And I really, I love the gold cravat pin with the Q on it. That's excellent. Um, one document we, we have says he stood six foot one inch tall and had a dark complexion and a dark eye. And I think this, this portrait really confirms that. Uh, in December of the same year, he married Annis Ramsdell, who was the fiance of Quill's brother John, who had been lost at sea in 1809 before the couple could marry. Um, but he, he outlived this wife as well. She, she died of heart disease in uh, August 1843. Um, but he, he didn't lose any time finding another wife. Uh, just three months later, he married Hannah Martin, who was 24 years his junior. And uh, she ultimately <coughs> outlived Quill by 25 years and, and died at the age of 82 in 1893. Um, and none of these marriages produced any children, as far as we can tell, either. Um, now, we're not entirely sure what he did all these years. The, the 1850 census listed him as a seaman with real estate worth uh, $1,200, which is a pretty good estate at that time. Uh, the 1829 portrait uh, suggests he was a fairly substantial member of the community, but what was he doing? Uh, surely he wasn't a common seaman anymore, uh, especially with his, his arm the way it was. Um, in his will, which he revised in 1845, he calls himself a gentleman and a trader, uh, trading in what he doesn't say. By 1860, he was listed as a confectioner, and uh, the value of his property had declined to $600. So, I don't know, what, uh, uh, if, if uh, you could make candies, I suppose, with only one arm. Um, but he continued to satisfy Marblehead's sweet tooth until his death on January 2nd, 1868 at the age of 80. And uh, here's his tombstone, along with, I think, a few of his wives, uh, or his, his parents, um, on Old Burial Hill, just down here. Now, last sailor I'd like to talk about tonight was named Samuel H. Green, and he was associated with an event that I'm sure you all know well. Green was born in Marblehead in May 1773, and uh, once again, we don't know a lot about his childhood or his experience before joining the Navy. Uh, we know he served as the master of several sailing vessels, or several vessels sailing out of Marblehead. Uh, he enlisted on Constitution in October 1813, and Captain Stewart immediately rated him quartermaster as well. And I should say that all four of the ship's quartermasters at this point were from Marblehead, uh, which is really a testament to the seafaring skill of the men from this town. Green was the victim of an unfortunate accident, the sort of thing that uh, I <laughs> must have just made him curse to think about it. Um, in his pension application, he said, while cruising off Barbados one night when beating to arms, he was severely and badly wounded in the leg by being accidentally cut and bruised by an iron hoop. Um, so you know, we can imagine the scene. Uh, it's the dark of night, and suddenly the drum starts to beat, uh, you know, calling the men to quarters. Uh, Green dives out of his hammock, like you see these guys doing here, uh, runs on deck, and in the darkness he careens into a match tub and smashes his leg. Um, a as a surgeon who examined him in 1837 put it, the wound, quote, consisted of a fracture to the forepart of the bone of his leg by an iron hoop connected with a match, type, a match tub in a dark night, and which resulted in an incurable running sore, which always has and probably always will be a great deal of trouble to him. Yeah. Uh, so this was in March 1814. By the end of the month, provisions were running low, and uh, the mainmast had this large crack running the whole length of it. Uh, and Captain Stewart decided he needed to head back to Boston to refit. On April 3rd, uh, the ship made landfall around Cape Ann and headed south for Boston in the light breeze. At around 8 a.m. that morning, uh, the, the lookout sighted two ships to the southeast and they were closing fast. As they got near, it was obvious that these were two British frigates uh, closing in to cut Constitution off from Boston. Uh, 
Stuart's only choice was to run into Marblehead to evade his pursuers. Uh, the only problem was how to get a ship as big as Constitution in there. Uh, Stuart first asked Quartermaster Samuel Anderton, who was also from Marblehead, uh, to pilot the ship in, but Anderton replied that Green, who had sailed as a shipmaster out of the port, was a more suitable choice. So the captain asked Green to pilot Constitution into Marblehead Harbor. Uh, no doubt he'd done this hundreds of times in many different vessels, but it, it still must have been a nerve-wracking job, especially with two 38-gun British frigates bearing down astern. Uh, they never actually got quite that close, but it uh, gives you the, the idea. Uh, worst of all, because of his injury, uh, he wasn't capable of standing. Uh, he had to be lifted out of his hammock, dressed and carried on deck, and he was placed in a chair that was then lashed to the rail uh, right next to the wheel so that he could both look over the side of the ship and talk directly to the helmsman. So anyway, he, uh, as, the, as soon as the ship was abreast of halfway rock, which if I know this correctly is way out here, so they're sailing in this direction, they suddenly decided, okay, we can run straight in for the harbor, uh, and that's what they did. Um, they, uh, obviously there, there were gun batteries erected there, uh, not just at Fort Sewell, but I believe there was one also uh, on the other side of the harbor. If anybody knows better, please let me know. Um, and they finally dropped anchor there in the harbor at 12.30. And the two British ships, the Junin and the Tenedos, uh, decided they weren't going to risk running into unknown waters uh, or face the shore batteries, and they gave up the chase, came about, and stood about um, six miles offshore. So a few hours later, Captain Stewart sailed Constitution around to Salem Harbor. And uh, after two weeks there, well, <laughs> the, the officers were, were feted apparently uh, all over town. Um, the British ships finally sort of disappeared and Constitution made a dash for Boston. Oh, in the meantime, Green's brother came and took him home to the family in Marblehead, where he stayed a few days until he was feeling better and then went on to rejoin the ship in Boston. He stayed on board until June, but his leg refused to heal and he was sent to the Marine Hospital in Charlestown. There he spent 119 days in bed uh, until the doctors finally thought he could return to duty and he rejoined the ship again uh, before she sailed in December of 1814. So he too was uh, on board during the battle with HMS Cyan and Levant uh, in February 1815 and uh, he was sent as a member of the prize crew to the captured Levant. Uh, unfortunately, Levant was cornered by a British squadron at Porto Praia in the Cape Verde Islands uh, and captured. All the prize crew were taken prisoner and sent to um, a prisoner uh, in Barbados. But um, luckily for them, uh, he wasn't there long, none of them were there long, because the news of the peace treaty uh, reached uh, Barbados soon thereafter and all the prisoners were sent home. Uh, we don't really know what he did after the war. Uh, he'd married a woman named Mary Florence in 1798 and he had a growing family. Um, he may have returned to sea, but I'm not entirely sure yet. Um, at any rate, his health steadily declined in the years after the war. And uh, by 1838, according to one, wit one witness, one side of him is wholly paralyzed and he is unable to move from his chair without help. And uh, he just continued to go downhill until he died of uh, palsy in 1843. So by the start of the Civil War, um, Nearly all the men who had signed on Constitution uh, almost 50 years before were dead. Um, a few like Quill and Darling made it a few more years, um, but by 1870 it, it seems that they were all gone. But uh, hardly forgotten, I think. Uh, this town, unlike any other place I've ever been, I have to say, has really cherished the memories of its heroes all these years. And uh, nowhere in all the towns or all the archives we visited during the course of this this uh, project have we really, have I encountered uh, a place with a better sense of its history? You know, you, I mean, you can still walk down the streets of Marblehead and think that, uh, well, some of these houses I'm sure these men lived in, um, but I mean, you go down to Fort Sewell and uh, you look out over the harbor there and you can think Constitution's just over the horizon, you know, <laughs> waiting to bring them home. So it's, uh, it's really been fascinating doing this research here in, in this town. Um, so that's all I have time for tonight. Uh, this is just a small fraction of uh, all the wonderful stories that we've uncovered about people from Marblehead, but also people from all over the United States and, and Great Britain.
And uh, if you're interested, I have another shameless plug for the book. There's a lot more stories in there. And um, if you haven't been down to Charlestown in a while or, or haven't been at all, I encourage you to come down, see the ship, uh, visit the museum. We've got all sorts of new exhibits and, uh, um, well, all sorts of things to see. And, uh, but the ship especially, because, uh, you know, as we like to say, the ship is the last surviving veteran of the War of 1812. And uh, at 215 years old, she's looking pretty good for her age. So thank you very much. Before, um, I, we do have time for questions, but I also just want, Matthew wouldn't know because when he saw the, the two portraits, they were in the Lee Mansion, but um, the portrait of Ezekiel, Ezekiel Darling and the portrait of, of uh, David Quill are in the exhibit downstairs, and you can see them in person this evening. Somehow I, I miss them when I walk. <laughs> <laughs> and an interesting point that the um, Ezekiel Darling portrait um, actually is um, painted by a Chinese artist. Oh, really? Oh, so that, that changes things. Yeah, so that's an interesting, um, if he was a trader, he, he most, you know, he would have um, gone to China and um, you know, probably oh. was maybe not a captain, but yeah. an officer. I didn't realize that. No, that's, that's excellent. Yeah, okay. so that's an interesting um, I'll to add that point. Um, but I know people have, have questions to ask. Yes. <laughs> There's a picture and the caption read, the town of Marblehead northeast mm. from Fort Sewell. Mm. And it would be south or southwest. Yeah, th I know. Isn't that strange? <laughs> I don't know if they meant that the fort is northeast of, of Marblehead. Yeah, I know. It's, it's an 1839 um, uh, woodcut engraving. Um, I don't know. That was that was the title they gave it <laughs> at the time. So it may be that the printer, whoever you know, in Boston or something, just had no idea. Probably didn't care and just <laughs> put that on there. Anything else? Yes, sir. When did the Constitution go out of active service? Uh, well, I mean, you could say she really hasn't gone out of active service. Uh, the the ship was um, used as uh, a well used as an active warship up until uh, the 1850s. It became a training vessel at Annapolis. Uh, during the Civil War, was moved to Newport, where she continued her role as a, as a training vessel. Um, after the war, she was refitted as a training vessel again um, and was sailing around until 1881, when the ship was taken up to the Portsmouth Navy Yard and uh, turned into what was called a receiving ship, basically a floating barracks. Uh, sailors who were waiting to be shipped out to different units would, would stay on board. Um, they built this sort of barn-like structure over the, over the ship, took the masts out. Uh, it really is what saved the ship, I think, because the weather wasn't getting into her that, that the way it would have been if she'd just been left open. But anyway, um, and then in 1897, she was brought back to Boston, <clears throat> and this whole series of restorations occurred through the, the course of the 20th century uh, to bring her back to, closer to her War of 1812 appearance that we see today. Yes. The, the, the vessel is the number one vessel, because it's not true. The active duty list of U.S. Navy ships in commission. In other words, of all the ships that are currently yeah. warships in commission, this takes the number one position. She's captained by a full commander. Right. Of the Navy. Right. Right. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The um, uh, she's got uh, commander. Uh, yeah, commander, lieutenant commander, a lieutenant, and. Um, my gosh, I'm not sure what their full compliment. Yeah, 70, 60 or 80 now, somewhere in there. Yeah. 70 80 in yeah. There, yeah. Because of security and all. Right. That. Sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. So definitely, still, still a commissioned vessel. Yeah. Yes, sir. Does the sister ship, the Constellation, have anywhere near the history of the Constellation? <laughs> That's a <laughs> depending on who you ask. That can be a, a very touchy subject. Um, the, the current thinking among, among most naval historians now is that that constellation is actually, um, she, they may have incorporated some of the timbers from the 1797 constellation uh, when they built this new ship in 1853, I think it was. Um, but most people think that there's really no connection. They, they, it's, it's a totally new vessel, um, a corvette or a sloop of war. Uh, that, was, that was actually the last sail, all sail vessel built by the US Navy. Um, so until, I don't know, 20 or 30 years ago, a lot of people thought, including um, 
uh, FDR was, <laughs> was adamant that uh, uh, the constellation was the original constellation, but um, from a lot of the work that's been done in the past, dec uh, past few decades, um, it seems that they're not, there's no connection other than the name. Chappelle had it in, 18, in 1949 in his book that it was that they had used the repair money to replace ships that were beyond economical yeah. repair without changing the names on the Navy list. Yeah, yeah. That was sort of a sleight of hand in some way. <laughs> yes, sir. You read about uh, how Mabel has uh, made poor soldiers and, and worse merchantmen. <laughs> and I wondered, I guess, because we didn't like discipline. And I wondered whether you got any of that out of your research. Um, I don't, you know, it's hard to say, obviously, the, the soldiering part. Um, none, of these, none of these men, I mean, significantly, none of them enlisted in the army, uh, at, that, as far as I know. Uh, I, know. I mean, there was, there was a company of the, um, the 4th U.S. Infantry stationed here uh, during the war, and maybe some others as well. So there's, there was that opportunity. But um, I mean, these, these were uh, self-respecting sailors. You know, they weren't going to, they weren't going to, they weren't going to make soldiers of themselves, I think. Um, it, you know, it's interesting, under Char uh, Charles Stewart, um, you get this sense from reading the logbooks that there was a much freer sense of discipline during those cruises than there had been under William Bainbridge, who was, by all accounts, you know, a, a flogging captain, as they said. He, he was flogging people all the time. Um, and even Isaac Hull, who was very well loved by his crew, seemed to have been a fairly strict disciplinarian. But Charles Stewart, he had all these, these people on board who had served as mates or masters in their own right, in their own merchant vessels. And um, you know, th there's accounts of him sort of uh, allowing the men to have free days where they could just do whatever they wanted on board, which um, some of the British prisoners, the, the British officers who were prisoners on board, they, they were like, you know, what are you, are you insane? What are you doing? <laughs> you know, because we did that on our ship, the crew would run riot. But, um, you know, there was, there, there, the, uh, the men on Constitution, I, I think, were just um, uh, uh, a cut above. Uh, a lot of a lot of other ships. 